All right, welcome back. Uh, in this video, we will go over Chapter 2, Basic Chemistry. All right, uh, the structure of matter. Uh, any substance that takes up uh, any amount of space, no matter how large, no matter how small, is made up of matter. And matter is composed up of particles called atoms. And remember atoms from uh, Chapter 1. Now, all atoms have three principal components, uh, protons, neutrons and electrons and there are parts that are smaller than these uh, several of them actually but these are the three main ones that we'll focus on uh, proton neutron and electrons and you'll need to know uh, where they're found in the atom and what type of electrical charge that they have all right uh, property or sorry uh, structure of atoms uh, protons these are found in the nucleus or the center of the atom and these have a positive electrical charge. So P for proton, P for positive. Uh, also in the nucleus of the atom are neutrons. And neutrons have no electrical charge or neutral charge. So N for neutron, N for neutral. All right. And lastly, uh, the electrons. These actually orbit the nucleus, kind of like the planets orbit the sun. And these have a negative charge. So of the three uh, particles that we talked about, Two of those three are found in the nucleus, the proton and neutron. The electrons are the only ones that orbit the nucleus. Okay. Here's a pretty standard view of the helium atom. Uh, the ones that are, have the positive sign are, are the positive particles. These are the protons. And ones that have no indication on it, those are neutral. Those would be the neutrons. And that whole area here would be the nucleus. And here, the negative symbols are the electrons that orbit the nucleus in, the, in a what's called an electron cloud and of course all these particles will vary in number depending on what element we're talking about all right uh, a substance that has atoms that have exactly the same number of protons is called an element now elements are the simplest thing that you can get in chemistry you can't you can't break it down into anything more simple if you have, say, a, a mass of carbon, you can't break it up and get anything other than carbon. You'll just get smaller bits of carbon. And the complete list of all known elements is called the periodic table. And this is how it looks. Sometimes you'll see this uh, color coordinated based on where the elements are. And actually, these here are, have been names. These uh, letters are not valid anymore. All right, now, the periodic table, I'll go back here, looks like it's kind of random, but there's a particular reason why these elements are where they are. There's a reason why carbon is here, where the cursor is, and not you know, here. There's a reason why calcium is here and not way over here. There is a or multiple reasons why elements are where they are. And just by knowing how to read some few uh, characteristics of the periodic table, you can tell a lot about that element based on where it's found. And also, uh, knowing where an element is in the periodic table, you can tell right away how many protons it has, how many neutrons it has, and how many electrons it should have. And we'll go over exactly how you would do that. All right, in addition to the element's actual symbol, at least one or two letters here, you'll see two separate numbers. One's a whole number here. You know, all the way up to 114 now, and one is a as a decimal in it usually. Uh, the atomic number is the whole number. It's always going to be you know, one, two, three, all the way up to 100. It's always going to be a whole number, and that number represents how many protons and electrons that element has. So right away, just by looking at the atomic number, you know how many of two of the three particles there are. Uh, the other number uh, usually has a decimal in it, usually, we'll go over why that is in a second, is the atomic mass. The atomic mass is the average weight of that element. So to find a number of neutrons, you would subtract the atomic number from this value, atomic mass, and then round to the nearest whole number. And we'll go over an example of how that would work. All right. This is lithium. This is how lithium would look if you were to pull it from the periodic table. So if we go back to here, 
lithium is right there. So if we were to take that square and make it really, really big, you would see this. The element symbol is Li. Uh, the whole number is the atomic number. So that tells you how many protons and electrons there are, three of each. And this would be the atomic mass. And we'll talk about why it's a decimal uh, number here in a second. So to find a number of neutrons, you take this value, round to a nearest number. Sometimes you round up, sometimes you round it down. So 6.94 run into the nearest whole number would be 7. So 7 and then subtract 3 gives you 4 neutrons. Now don't always assume that the difference is going to be 1. Sometimes the difference will be you know, 5 or 10 or it could be you know, 60 or 70. So this is true, this whole pattern here is true for every single element in the periodic table. And you will have something like this on your test for this chapter. I will give you a random uh, randomly picked elements. It won't be lithium, obviously, but it'll work out exactly the same way. This whole number will give you the number of protons and electrons, and for neutrons, this number run into a nearest whole number because you can't have a fifth of a neutron. You can't have a tenth of a neutron. So this number rounds up to seven. Seven subtract three gives you four. All right, we talked about uh, a few minutes ago about how the atomic mass is usually a decimal number. And the question is, well, why is that the case? Why is it not a nice, even number? Well, that's because all elements can exist in more than one format. You can have elements with different masses. So that's why the atomic mass is the average weight of that element. That's why for lithium, if you were to take all the examples of lithium that are found, if you take the average weight of all of those, you get 6.94. Okay. And the reason why you have a different mass for some different forms of lithium is because it's due to the different number of neutrons. So it's neutrons that will give you that added weight to those new forms of this element. And these different forms, these different versions of these elements are called isotopes. All right, moving on from elements, we'll move on to compounds. Whenever you have elements combining together, you have what's called a compound. So it's two or more elements joined together. It has to be at least two, but there's no limit on what the top number could be. Here are some very common examples. Water, H2O. Hydrogen and oxygen. Those are two elements. Salt, sodium chloride. Sodium and chloride, two elements. For sugar, it's uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, three elements. So it has to be at least two to be considered a compound. But again, there is no limit to how many there could be. All right, and compounds are held together uh, by one to three different types of bonds, how these elements can join together. And they will vary in strength and what shape it gives that compound. Uh, the strongest type of bond is called the covalent bond. These are where electrons are shared equally between elements. Very, very strong, very hard to break. Uh, the next one down, the next weakest, is called an ionic bond. This is formed when electrons are stolen by one element by another, forming what's called an ion, which is an element with a charge to it. And the weakest of the three bonds we'll talk about is a hydrogen bond. This helps give a compound a three-dimensional shape to it. And I'll give an example of all these here in a second. So know what types of bonds there are, know which one is the weakest, know which one is the strongest. Over here uh, is an example of a covalent bond. These red things here with the negative indication are the electrons. These are shared equally between both of these elements. So that would be very hard to break. An example of an electron, or uh, sorry, example of an ionic bond. Here, this electron is stolen by this element. So now there's two over here and zero over here. So but they share that bond here. But it's not shared equally, so it's not as strong. That's why this is an ionic bond. And a good example of a uh, hydrogen bond is in the, the shape of DNA found in you know, all of our cells. That's why DNA has that, that spiral staircase kind of look to it, that he, uh, helical shape to it. It's due to hydrogen bonding. These are very weak, very easy to break. 
All right, next we'll move on to uh, different types of chemical reactions. At the core of any cell function is chemistry and chemical reactions. Some compounds have to be uh, put together to make something larger. Sometimes compounds have to be broken down and be used uh, in smaller bits. So all reactions have two components. We have uh, the starting materials, which are called reactants, and then the ending materials, which are the products. And I have, from here on, the rest of the notes are uh, color-coordinated. The reactants I have in red, and the products are going to be in this purple color. And all chemical reactions are written this way. Reactants, this stuff here, will react and give you, or will yield, that's what the arrow means, to give you these products. So this stuff combines together to give you this product. And there are different types of reactions, and you'll need to be able to recognize what type each one that I give you is. And there are actually four types. Uh, synthesis, decomposition, exchange, and reversible. Uh, the first one, synthesis. When you synthesize something, you are making something bigger. So you have two or more smaller reactants are making one larger product. So it's usually written like this. You know, a plus B will give you AB. So that's how it's written in generic form. Here's how it would look in a real example. Nitrogen plus hydrogen, those two combine together to give you one product, ammonia. There's always going to be more stuff on the left-hand side of the arrow than there is on the right-hand side of the arrow. These two join to make that. These two join to make that. You are synthesizing one larger product. And the opposite of that will be decomposition, where you have one larger reactant being broken down into smaller products. It is decomposing. It's breaking down. So another way to write it in general terms, uh, AB will break down or give you A and B. An example here, H2CO3 will break down and give you water and carbon dioxide. So again, you have less stuff on the left-hand side as compared to the right-hand side. That is breaking down to give you these smaller bits. That is breaking down or decomposing into these smaller bits. Okay. Uh, next type is called an exchange or replacement sometimes. Uh, you have parts of the reactant and compounds are switching places as products. So you don't have more stuff over here versus more stuff over here. What you have are two elements switching places. So the way it's normally written, uh, AB plus CD will give you AD plus CB. And here's a common example here. If we look at the elements here, uh, AG and NO3 are together here, and then sodium and chloride are over here. But in the products, AG is now with chlorine, Cl. So that has switched places with that. And then sodium and NO3 go together. So you don't have two things making one thing or one thing breaking down into two things. You have the same number of stuff on either side of the arrow. All you're having happen is two elements are switching places. That's why it's called an exchange. So AG would normally be with this, but as a product it gets paired up with chlorine. Okay. And the last one is probably the easiest to pick out. It's called reversible. And this is very common for most uh, biological reactions. You have products are going uh, back to reactants, then those reactants are forming their products, and it goes back and forth constantly. And the easiest way to pick out these reactions are by the double arrow. So you have these two components, these reactants, forming this product. This will break down into these two components. They will combine together to form this. And this keeps going back and forth in a continuous cycle. So for a, a normal example, uh, CaO plus carbon dioxide will give you this. That quickly breaks down into these two components again, which combine to form this, and this goes back and forth. But again, the double arrow is a dead giveaway that is a reversible reaction. That's the only time that you'll see a double arrow like this in chemistry for a reversible reaction. All right, we talked about reactions. Now we'll talk about uh, acids and bases. Uh, first, the definitions of the two. An acid is a substance that will release hydrogen ions in water. 
and the way you write a hydrogen ion is H, the symbol for hydrogen, and the plus symbol. Acids are, are given away by their sour taste to them. Uh, bases uh, usually have a bitter taste to them, and these will uh, combine or release a hydroxide ion, OH negative. So don't confuse hydrogen ion, H plus, with hydroxide ion, OH minus. Now having a large amount or a concentration of either acids or base can be incredibly dangerous. Uh, the body can only handle a very small window of strength of acids or bases. And there's a scale used to measure the relative strengths of acids and bases, and it's called the pH scale. And the scale will range from the number 1 to 14. Uh, and of course this is in bold and red for a reason. You need to know what number goes to what part of the scale. Uh, the lower numbers, 1 to 6, are acidic. Uh, number 7 is the right in the middle of the scale it is neutral. It is neither acidic nor uh, basic. It is like distilled water. It is completely neutral. And the higher numbers are going to be uh, basic, so 8 to 14. And you usually see it like this. This is just a typical way to uh, demonstrate this, the pH scale going from 1 all the way to 14. Uh, the lower numbers are acidic. So 1, a pH of 1, an example would be a gastric acid or stomach acid. Very, very strong acid. As you get a higher number, they get weaker and weaker acid. Now urine at a pH of 6 is a weak acid. 7 is neutral. It has properties of neither the acids or the bases. And a good example is distilled water. It's just nothing to it. Uh, then the higher numbers are going to be more basic, and the higher you get, the more, or the higher in strength you go. So bleach is a very, very strong base. A stomach acid is a very, very strong acid. So you start, if you're looking at these numbers here, strong acid, still strong, getting weaker, getting weaker, really weak, nothing. Weak base, a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger, really, really strong, and then really, really strong. So what I would do on a test would be to give you a number and ask you, is this acidic, is this uh, neutral, is it basic? So 6 down are acids, 7 is neutral, and 8 and up are bases, or basic. All right, next we'll talk about uh, organic compounds. An organic compound is any compound that contains carbon. It doesn't have to be any certain amount of carbon, but as long as it has you know, at least one atom of carbon, it's considered to be organic. Now, all living organisms function due to uh, the interactions of several organic compounds. And there are four types that we have uh, as humans. Uh, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. The first one, uh, carbohydrates. This is another term for sugars. So all sugars as an example of a carb, a carbohydrate. This is where organisms get their energy from. So carbohydrates are very necessary for your cells to function. You need some type of sugar, otherwise your cells can't do anything. Uh, carbohydrates are made up of uh, building blocks called saccharides. So when we go over these four types of uh, organic compounds, you need to know what they do, what their main function is that I give you, and what they're made up of. So carbs are made up of saccharides. Here are some common examples. A monosaccharide, mono means one. So that word literally translates to one sugar, like glucose. It's a very common uh, carb. Disaccharide, di means two, so two sugars. An example will be sucrose. And it's, as, uh, it's not in the notes, Paul, but let's mention it here now. Any compound that ends in the ending O-S-E is going to be an example of a sugar. So lactose, fructose, sucrose, all those are examples of sugars. Just by the ending of the word tells you exactly what it is. All right, here's an example of how it would be drawn. Uh, monosaccharide, one sugar unit, sucrose has two, and starch is a, is a complex sugar. It has a very peculiar shape to it. All right, next we have lipids. These are another term for fats. And lipids are used to store energy. Now you get energy from the food that you eat. Some of that energy is used right away.
but a lot of it is stored away for later. And lipids are made up of building blocks called a fatty acid, which looks like a tail of the unit, and a glycerol uh, head of the compound. And I'll show you how those look. So both the fatty acids and the glycerol make up a lipid. And this is how it would look. The glycerol and the head of the compound. And this example has three fatty acids. This would be a triglyceride here. So this is an example of a lipid. This is how energy gets stored in the body. All right, there are some very common types of fatty acids, uh, including saturated and unsaturated. Most people have heard of the terms, but they have no idea what those terms actually reference. So we'll go over what those mean here. Uh, saturated fatty acids. All the carbon bonds within this compound are linked by single bonds. These are also solid at room temperature. These are the ones that are not healthy because they are solid at room temperature. These are the fatty acids that usually end up clogging arteries. And the opposite of that would be an unsaturated fatty acids. There's at least one or more uh, double carbon bonds found in this compound. And these are liquid at room temperature. These are much healthier. These are usually from uh, plant sources, like corn oil, uh, you know, canola oil, olive oils. Those are better for you because they're unsaturated. And this is how this would look. These little sticks here are the bonds that are found between these elements. All of these here are all single bonds. This is saturated. This would be uh, unhealthy for you. It probably tastes better, but not healthy for you at all. So this one would be saturated. The one down here, this one double mark here that is indicating a double bond. Because of that double bond, it causes that compound to bend, to kind of kink over itself. This would be liquid at room temperature. This is healthier for you than this. So the way I could ask this on a test is to give you an image similar to this and ask you, is this saturated, is this unsaturated? And the one thing that gives it away is a double bond like this. All right, next we'll move on to proteins. It would be very difficult to go over every function that a protein has, but the ones we'll just mention here uh, for our class, uh, tissue repair, uh, immunity, speeding up chemical reactions, but there are literally dozens of functions that proteins have. Uh, the building blocks of proteins are called amino acids. All right, proteins have different levels of their structure depending on how complex they are. They go from primary to secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And if you can tell, you know, primary means one, secondary means two, tertiary means three, uh, quaternary means four. The higher that number gets, the more complex it is. So primary, this is a linear sequence of amino acids basically a straight line. Think of this as a as a pearl necklace. The one amino acid next to another amino acid, all in a straight line. That's a very simple basic structure of a protein. When that protein starts to twist and coil, it now becomes a secondary protein because you're getting more complex. When that protein starts to get a three-dimensional shape due to the hydrogen bonding, like we have with DNA, it's called tertiary because it's getting even more complex. If you have two or more of these tertiary proteins joining together, where it's one big tangled mass, very, very complex structure, it's called quaternary. So simple, a little more advanced, a little more advanced, really, really advanced. Okay, this is how they would look. Uh, the one up here, the amino acids are these red circles here. So amino acid next to amino acid next to amino acid, all these in the straight line. That's primary. When it starts to uh, form a pleated sheet or starts to coil, it becomes secondary, like these two. When you get a three-dimensional uh, shape to it because of hydrogen bonding, you get tertiary. And when you get two or more of these joining together, you get something that's really hard to represent on paper. It's a quaternary structure. So very, very complex and very, very simple. All right, move on to the uh, last of the four organic compounds, nucleic acids. These are what will carry genes and code for a cell's function. The DNA that makes you, you, as a type of nucleic acid. And there are actually only two types of nucleic acids known, DNA and RNA. That's what the NA stands for in these two uh, acronyms. D 
DNA, you know, the stuff that is your blueprint that makes you you, actually stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. So the NA it tells you what it is. And the building blocks that form nucleic acids are called nucleotides. All right, here's an example of how DNA and RNA would look. You know, DNA has that spiral staircase or the, what's called a helix, helical shape to it. And RNA only has one strand to it. So ribonucleic acid, deoxyribonucleic acid. Only two examples of nucleic acids that we have. All right, that brings us to the end of chapter two. Again, highly recommend keeping up this material on a daily basis. Don't just wait until you know, the day of the test to look at it. If you have questions, please contact me.